Well, I'm here today with the legend, Brian Dirksen. So great to have you, my friend, here on the Beyond Sunday podcast. How are how are things today? Oh, they are really good. And it's always a joy and fun to have conversations about these kinds of things. So I was looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too. I want to ask you, Brian, like before we dive into some specific topics, I'd love to hear from you just like, what are you most excited about right now? Could be ministry, work-related, or family, anything. Wow, most excited. Well, probably I'd have to say, and it's kind of like a new risky kind of thing, but I'm I'm about to start recording a Love Songs album. And sort of in the middle of COVID, I had this really kind of aha moment that the world is filled with love songs about falling in love but there's not a lot of love songs about staying in love. And Joyce and I are going to celebrate our 40th anniversary this year. And so, but the thing, interesting thing was I, I, I went to, I thought, oh, I'll write my darling a love song. And I have a weekly songwriting appointment with myself Friday morning at 9 a.m. And I walk over to the piano and I start writing this song that just comes out of this our story and everything. And I'm like, oh, this was special. So then the next Friday, I, I work on another one. And then the next Friday, and you know, about two years later, I've got 40 love songs about long love anyway. So yeah, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm less than a month away from walking into a studio with a new producer, a new set of musicians and a whole new creative project, something I've never tried before, but, but I, 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 I feel great about, it. like, I feel great about the songs and, and I, you know, as you know, you and other creatives understand when you're, when you're in that creative process, there's something that brings you to life that just doesn't happen any other way. So yeah, we'll see what happens. It's the working title is love for a lifetime. And we hope to encourage not just couples who have shared a long love, but young people who live in a, in a world where increasingly there's no expectations of it, even in Christian context often. And I, I just want to encourage people that, that the longer you walk together with your partner and with your, with your, your spouse, that the more you you learn from each other and the more you recommit and the more love you share and, and how God's love sustains us in our marriage commitment. So yeah, we'll see what happens. I love that. That sounds, that sounds exciting. So how many years you've been married? Well, we're heading, we're going to hit in a few months, we'll hit 40 years. 40 years. Hey, no, That's amazing. No, I have a, I have a 35 year old daughter, our eldest, and sometimes I just, you know, I, I remember hearing this when I was in my 20s from somebody I was a friends with who was in their 60s, and they looked at me and they said, you do understand that that those of us that you see as old feel exactly the same inside as you. We just have traveled this road a little bit farther, and so our bodies start showing our age, but we're, we're still that, that girl or that boy or that young man, whoever we were. Yes, we've changed, but in essence, we're still the same. We're still the child inside, right? And okay. And now here I am, you know, I can see 60 on the horizon. I'm 58, right? And you go, oh my God. Yeah. And, yes. and I, I was just at a, I was just leading a retreat for a church and this woman comes up to me all excited. Oh, Brian, it's so, I'm so excited to meet you, to see you again. Last time I saw you, you had hair. Wow. And then she, and then she took her. What did I just say? And then I realized that, oh yeah, I'm still the same me inside, but you know, my body shows the years, including the loss of my hair. So, Hey. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm turning 40 this year. So August okay. 5th, I will cross over. You see the... that on the horizon. It probably feels like a momentous milestone, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And I'm curious, Brian, like you've been you've been writing songs and releasing music for a long time. And it seems like to me, 
you're not slowing down. Even as you approach 60, you are mm. continuing to fan that flame, the gift mm. that God has given you. And I wonder if you could just reflect on that. What's what's mm. it like creating now compared to, you know, when you were in your your 20s? Compare the two eras. Well, maybe I'll start with... Uh with a Walter Brueggemann quote, you know, Old Testament scholar, well-respected. And um, he talks about the Psalms as Psalms of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation, right? And you, you can see this pattern unfolding, you know, Psalms of certainty, then all of a sudden you're into this, this lament and this need to, for grief and disorientation. And then you eventually you reemerge reorientation. You know, so for me, when I think about writing songs and as what's the difference in my twenties to in my fifties, I think in my twenties, you start, everything feels clearer. You, 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 maybe you're in that season of orientation where your faith is fresh and you've had these, these experiences and you're confident. And if you get some reinforcement at that stage that this is actually working and it's actually part of your calling, okay, then you're, and then what happens is along comes life like a freight train and sometimes just, just sets you into seasons of disorientation. And for me, it was, you know, a couple of church split blowouts that I got caught in the middle of trying to be a peacemaker, trying to get people who were on opposite ends to come back together and it didn't work. And then we had a son, our first son with fragile X syndrome, and we knew we would have to care for him the rest of his life. And, and so certain things just start happening. And, and actually in the middle of all of that, you know, I, I say I lost my words. I, I went into a five year wordless winter where I couldn't write songs. I mean, I would, I would sing the Psalms because the Psalms are so inclusive in their emotional language, which includes the difficult ones. So I could, I could create a tune for a Psalm, but I couldn't write my own words. I was just too disoriented. And that was about 2010 to 2015. So, but now. I, when I reemerged from that wordless winter with the first little spark, I, I, I describe it maybe almost as if I had this experience where this person was speaking at, at a, I was teaching at a college at the time and the per, a guest speaker came in and said, you do know that Jesus in his resurrected body still has scars. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there and going, I, I, I was sitting among the students, even though I was a professor for the class and I put, say that again, you know. And then and she says it again. And I said, it's like a, it was like a defibrillator being taken to my songwriting heart. Go, oh. you know, wow. like my King has got scars on his hands. I got to sing that. Right. And it was the first time I had a phrase that wasn't directly from scripture that I thought, oh, I could start writing lyrics again and melodies again. And then, and then since then, in the last, you know, eight, nine years, I have more songs that I've written probably than all the years before. And I probably have about, you know, between 50 to a hundred songs that are completed that I haven't been able to record yet. And I don't, you know, I, I mentioned before, I'm working on a love songs project. So I got 40 of those, but I got a whole bunch of new worship songs that people have not heard. I've got a Christmas movie musical that I've written with a friend and a whole bunch of Christmas songs and telling that's, you know, so it's like. There's not enough time, Brian. There's not enough time. So well, the songwriting thing, the engine is still very much alive and going, but I'm also loving, encouraging and mentoring and teaching other songwriters to write songs. So, but so, so, and there's changes, like you change some of your perspectives and your opinions over time, but the, the core for me about writing about love and about leaning into the love of God remains the same. And, and the process is the same. I wait for a seed, you know, I wait for a little idea and a ha moment to drop into the soil of my heart, like a seed. And then I, 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 
I go to work and I, I write and I rewrite and I, I, I spend time, I take my time. You know, I'd rather write less songs more thoroughly than tons of songs that are all sound the same. You know, I, I wait for that unique seed, you know. Anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's been interesting. Yeah, you know, I just had Brenton Brown on the podcast like two months ago. Oh, and oh Brenton, so, yeah. We, he's hilarious, but we, we reflected yes. a bit on, you know, Winds of Worship 12 and Hungry mm. and, you know, those Vineyard UK days. And he gave you all the credit, by the way, about what, for those records. And I know you produce them. And But I'm just curious how how you've been able to pivot maybe recover is too strong of a word. There was such mm -hmm. wild popularity with like vineyard music back in the nineties where God mm -hmm. used, I mean, changed my life, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm a worship leader. I don't know if I, I'd still be a worship leader without some of your songs and your projects mm -hmm. that really, I don't know, formed me, but mm -hmm. how, how have you been able to pivot from what God was doing then to understand, hey, God's doing something now and not sort of saying, you know, just look back at the good old days. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Well, it's a both and because there's still, there's still some life in some of those songs. For and sure. in fact, you know, like just last week, according to when we're having this conversation, I was in Denver at the Vineyard National Leaders Conference, and they brought me in and Cindy Rethmeyer in because they specifically wanted to have an evening of almost like telling the story of the Vineyard movement in song. And so there we were singing some of those old songs, even before my time, like All the Earth Shall Worship. And songs like that, Cindy's Exalt the Lord, my song, Faithful One, come and fill me up. And, you know, like for probably some of the young leaders that they were there, they were like, oh, this is interesting. Like, like, but there was just this wave of participation and yeah. life in the room when we started singing some of those old songs, Refiner's Fire. Yep. And, you know. And yet at the same time, throughout all of those years, for me, the heart of it was really simple. It was like, I want to be involved in things that are vulnerable, intimate, God directed, honest, not hyped. Yes. And meanwhile, through all of that, I'm, I'm walking in friendship and relationship with some, with people that are involved in my family, my wife, Joyce, our children. And then we have our special needs son who requires, you know, ongoing constant support and care and all of those things stay constant. And so, you know, like, yes, there was a surge of, you know, popularity. And so if, if I was doing an event in Europe or in Canada, where I've mainly done my live events, you know, it, it back in the nineties, you know, there would be a thousand, sometimes 2000 people show up. And now when I do an event, there is like maybe several hundred people show up. But the thing is those people that are at the events now, like I just did a nights of worship across Canada, 11 nights across, and we had between three to 600 people each night. And the people that were there really wanted to be there. And the stories they've told me and the presence that was there when we started singing was, was just the same. Yeah. It's maybe not as big of crowds, but it's so, and they're, they're like human scaled events. Like for me, Cause I'm a shy, introverted, sensitive person. So I find even sometimes the really big things, a real struggle. And in fact, I was involved in a couple of, you know, a big festival in the UK, big church festival in May. There was another large event in Canada that was kind of an offshoot off, off the side of the tour. But my favorites by far are get together with a smaller group of people be in the same place, breathing the same air, lifting the songs, telling the stories behind the songs. Cause some people don't know, 
where did come now is the time to worship come from that that must have come like when you're you know you're on the mountaintop and you're experiencing the best of life and everything and then they find out oh no it wasn't you know so all of those experiences i you know and i don't know i just i just want to keep doing this in the way whatever serves people whatever encourages people and whether it's five ten people in a in a living room somewhere or a few hundred people in a church service wherever it is you know just the gift of it the gift of it's still it's still a marvel to me yeah brian what what have you learned about empowering and raising up worship mm -hmm. leaders artists as I look back on, you know, come now is the time to worship and hungry and surrender and all those projects. I'm like, how did you do that? You're bringing together all these like young people with so many different sounds. Like a lot of those records aren't even like you're like Brian Dirksen's sound, but you were right. able to pull out this creativity with all these young people that were super talented, but probably didn't have a clue what they were doing. Like if you could just list off like, here's what I did or here's what I've learned about raising up and releasing young leaders, what would you say? Well, I, I think, I mean, in one sense, the heart of it is really simple. And the heart of it is that I recognize in myself that I'm going to contribute a small part of what we need as the church to express our hearts back to God, our hearts to each other, to tell our story that I've written a, a handful of songs and they come through my mother tongue, you know, my, the, the music that moves me, but music and even spirituality is a vast, diverse world that needs, it all needs to be expressed. And so when I, when I went to the UK, I mean, remember I arrived there in quite in weakness and brokenness. We had just found out our son had fragile X would require care for the rest of his life. We had been launching a, a musical called father's house. The album had done really well. And then we put a stage musical it had done initially really well. Then we tried to take it professional and kaboom, it collapsed, lost over a million dollars. Wow. We were on the verge of personal bankruptcy and we arrived in the UK, not knowing a soul. So there I am. And I'm like, it was such a real, it was a gift to serve somebody else's vision for a season because I'm a visionary. And when your vision, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And, they, and the last one had initially worked and then collapsed. And so John and Eller Mumford you know, were my bosses. They okay. actually funny. Of course, it's the, it's the, the parents of Mark Mumford of Mumford and sons. And Marcus was actually on my worship team at church, but anyway, and so it was such a gift, like, and, and, and they, what they said is we would love if the vineyard churches in UK and Ireland and Wales and Scotland could learn to write their own worship songs, worship songs that sound like us sound like it come from this soil, from this geography, from this generation. And I went, oh, that's, that's totally what I love encouraging. In fact, you know, when my first batch of songs came out back in the, the late eighties, early nineties, like refiners, fire, faithful one churches started asking me, could you come and teach our worship leaders to write songs? And I remember first thinking like, why are they asking me? Like I'm, I'm 23, 24, 25 years old. I've just started. But the thing was, I'm the son of two educators. And I thought to myself, let's give this a shot. So I race off to the library, check out every book I could find on songwriting. It's no internet at the time, of course. And then I, I, I just learn from those books, but I learn from my process and I'm a, both a right and left brain thinker. I'm very organized and analytical, but I'm also creative. I, anyway, I start teaching, yeah. go back to the UK. So I gathered what I, well, we gathered the, the worship leaders from the movement and I kept on asking them, who are you? What's your mother tongue? If you were given complete freedom to express yourself, what would you do? 
and we would listen to music together and then they would play me drafts of things and I would go, oh, I love that. Ooh, you probably got to work on this issue craft wise with that. So, and, and we just started building relationship and friendship and everything was about me standing behind them doing everything I could. And so the Brenton Browns, Catherine Scott's, the Michael Fry's, the, the, these people, they, they had talent and they had passion, but they had no experience and not a lot of confidence yeah. that they could do it. And for some reason, because I spoke in a Canadian accent, they believed me when I said, no, you can do it. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, watch out for that. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. It was funny. Just the other day I was at the leading us retreat for a church and they started singing humble King. Oh, kneel me down again. You're at your feet. Bread to the song. Love that. And the thing was the whole story came back to me. And I remember Brenton presenting me the first draft. And there was like several lyrics in there. I went, Brenton, this is a great song, but that lyric's going to get you in trouble. And he, his eyes get big and he goes, it will. And I go, yeah, think about this. And I would tell him, oh, and he goes, oh, you're right. That lyric will get me in trouble. Let me go back to the drawing board, you know? And so, and then he worked and I, I would nudge him. Oh no, a little bit more like, oh, you know, and, and then now, you know, years later to just show up at some random church retreat and the young worship leader who's probably in their mid twenties starts singing, oh, kneel me down again. And I almost start weeping because wow. I realize that that song is there because of Brenton. The song is also there because of me, because I came alongside Brenton and I said, you can do this, watch out for this. And at that, it's that kind of interaction between the next generation person and the, maybe the one generation slightly older, that's not that's not threatened by the next, I wasn't threatened at all by these guys. I mean, a lot of them were more talented than me. Hmm. I need them. Wow. I need the songs they're going to write. And you know, truth, truth be told since then, countless times I use their songs as a worship leader. I sing, be the center all the time. I sing humble King all the time. You know, I sing these songs and then I think my world and and our expression of worship is richer because these people wrote the songs oh yeah i helped encourage this awesome thank you lord for giving me the gift of life and the gift of grace to be able to be in the right place at the right time yeah. but i think anybody could do this well maybe not anybody but way more people can do this way more people can write meaningful songs if they're willing to learn the craft, if they're willing to walk alongside a mentor and actually listen, I think some of the problem with some of worship writers, I'm going to say these days, it's always been this way is they don't want to take any input from somebody who's walked the road before them. They're threatened by it. But if you can find a mentor, that's not threatened by your gifting and is willing to be honest with you and actually help you write the songs that are uniquely yours to write. I mean, that's gold, right? And that's what I've tried to be. And you've, you've described that, that season. It's, it's really special what came out of it. And I, yeah. I still pinch myself that I was in the middle of it somehow. Yeah. Brian, I wonder if you could speak on, I, I compare worship music today sometimes with like that nostalgic music of my childhood and, mm -hmm. and I could be off here, but I feel like there was more maybe artistic risk taking involved in like let's let's push the envelope musically let's mm -hmm. let's kind of push the arts down the road i remember like vineyard canada like wide wide world with david roos mm -hmm. or there was a, a yeah. song i remember dance on it you know that was just yeah. really like yeah. pulling all these really unique sounds and worship music has become a little bit it's definitely more mainstream more palatable for congregations but were you trying to push the envelope or was this just a natural outflow of what God was doing in your communities? Well, I think both. I mean, the, in, in truth, I do think that modern worship music has become more calculated. It's become more, I think, um, and this isn't an improvement in my opinion, a bit more of a product of record labels, radio 
format programming, all these things with all of these parameters that yep. it's got to fit within. Ultimately, I think we're poorer for it because I think the reality is when I look at the human race, when I look at the diversity of culture, races, genders, ages, cultures, I think worship music should sound as diverse as all of that, not some, you know, I don't know, it's just too, too limited. So, so when we were doing some of those things, again, it was always my heart as a producer and as a mentor to say, you know, what's your mother tongue? Yeah. What, what is the sound of your heart when you, when you're alone? And you're not calculating everything. You're just letting your heart show lyrically, musically, sonically what comes out. And, and, you know, some of the songs you describe, whether it was some of David's stuff or, you know, different people that I was working with, it was so interesting how the rhythms and the tones and the phrasing was always just kept on changing. And. And like, I was just on, I, I was just doing these evenings of worship and music songs and stories across Canada and wherever possible in each of the local places, I would bring up a local writer onto the stage with me and get them to share a song that they're working on. And it was so amazing again, wow. because and the, some of these were writers I've worked with through my unlocking your songs program, where I mentor and train songwriters. But what was so interesting again, is you could feel in the room, like people were there because of me, they trusted me. They wanted to spend an evening with me and my songs. And then I bring up somebody that wasn't on the bill, so to speak, was never, they've never met before. And then this person opens their mouth and this completely different thing happens in the room, right? Well, because they're a unique person, a vessel that, that this, that this love and this creativity is flowing through. And as soon as they open their mouth, their the, the distinction of their voice, the distinction of the kind of melodies and lyrics. And I love, and I would just, I would just smile. I would just stand there and go, because you could feel this wave of surprise and pleasure roll through the audience and they go, oh, this is special. Well, yeah, it is special because they're special because they're, you know, they're a daughter or son of God and they. And they have a unique gift and I don't know. So I, I think, I think we have, we have a, a, a big job still to do. And one of the thing, one of my dreams, when we talk about church and worship and songs is that we, that each church would sing locally, local songs, maybe at least 50% of their songs, local versus imported. And that's kind of how I rolled in my youth. We, we started writing our own songs. It's got to the point where more than half of the songs we sang were our own. And I think there's, there's a type of, I don't even know what the word is. Impoverishment is a heart is maybe too strong of a word, but I think there's a loss when a church only sings imported songs hmm. and doesn't sing songs written from within written from within their, their story, written from within their geography, written from within their community of relationships and the things that are bubbling to the surface. Now, of course, for that to happen, we need more people trained and equipped to write quality songs because it's not helpful to sing local if the quality is poor, right? Yeah. Like if you've got it, you've got the choice between a good written, well-written import and a poorly written local song, will you choose the well-written import that still says what your heart wants to say? But what if the quality of the local songs is there and then that comes with all of the relationship and all the connections and all, all of that? That's my dream. Yeah. I want to see more people singing local and I want to help mentor and encourage that to happen. How would you encourage a team to do that? I think some worship leaders struggle with it, and I think some lead pastors struggle. I was just talking with a pastor a couple of days ago who who saw no value in their team writing songs, and I was trying mm -hmm. to, you know, convince him a little bit, just talk to him about, hey, there, there's a value 
in writing mm -hmm. for your local community. It, it fosters prayer and intercession and paying attention mm -hmm. to what God is doing. Mm -hmm. But how would you practically advise, like, say, a senior pastor and a worship leader to navigate that discussion? Well, first of all, I would say to the pastors that that the long-term fruit from singing local is going to be amazing because of all of what you just said. You're going to get a bigger buy-in from your congregation. You're going to get a bigger gathering together. Oh, this is us. Mm. But in order to get that long-term, you're going to have to be willing to take some short-term pain and that is the process of what it takes for local writers to learn the craft and for you as a pastor you have to be willing to support them and encourage them yeah but if you're willing to do that the fruit is going to be amazing and you know we we my son-in-law and I, we were doing this thing called Unlocking Your Songs, which is all about trying to support that. And I would encourage local groups to form songwriting circles. I mean, you're only going to get that, the good result, if you're willing to commit to a long-term, you know, as I say, a long obedience in the same direction, learning the craft, being honest with each other, with each other having a safe place to try things out. And if it's not quite there, you know, don't, don't, you know, I, I say to young writers and worship leaders, like the Sunday service, your main gatherings are not, they're, they're not a platform for you to try out all of your, your, your songs and your half done, whatever. No, no, you got to do that. That's a separate thing. You learn the craft and you form a songwriting circle and you, you, you support each other. And then once the songs, the quality start to come and the connections start to come, then you start serving your whole church with it, yeah, but, I, but you have to have a heart for it. Yeah. I encourage writers to, what are those kind of fringe gatherings where you can test yeah. things out? It might not be Sunday morning, but it might be like at the altars at the end of service where you can tag a yeah. chorus you're working on with a popular song or in small groups, yeah. like you're saying, like you do yeah. have to, at some point you can't just, it can't just be you in your prayer closet. You have to yeah. open it up be vulnerable and kind of see how things land, you know? Yeah. So absolutely. Brian, how do you, I think like today worship has become an industry and I was just talking with Kim Walker about this recently and sh she had some great thoughts just about, it's just a little uncomfortable, you know, just how, what it should be reserved for God has become just this massive industry and you commented on it a little bit just with kind of the commercialization of worship music and labels like this is what works for radio and so a lot of our songs kind of fit in this box on the one hand you're wanting to empower and encourage local songwriters but how do we navigate like maybe the ickiness of the industry or maybe it maybe it shouldn't even feel like that like how do you how do you navigate that tension between the purity of worship in a local context and wanting to write hit worship songs well i mean you you really have to let go of any propensity or desire to write a hit you mm. you know like there's i i and and ultimately to say that you know some a hit and even i would say even writers in all genres have to rec come to recognize this that ultimately a hit is a result of a whole bunch of people saying this song spoke for me and I want to hear it again. I want to sing it again. Okay. So we can do our best to write the best song we can that speaks for people. I, I, I try and encourage, you know, Christian worship writers to stop trying to write to people and sing for people. You know, that, that sense of identification, but the result of what happens, obviously there's a part that, you know, um, there's, well, let's, let's talk about it in terms of songcraft and media for a moment on the songcraft side, you want to do the best job you can in writing the best song that speaks for you and hopefully speaks for other people. And if, if the song is really 
well written and touched you know we use language like anointed or touched by god or whatever this mysterious thing is yeah then it potentially travels right and that's great that's apart from the effort of the songwriter honestly again the songwriter's only job is to do the best job they can in writing the most genuine heart you've got that but then you've got this media side, which is a little bit like the industry. And there's, there are bizarre, bizarre, I don't even know what the word is, but there is evidence that you can even take a, if the, if the media decides and they pummel you enough with something, you're, you're psychologically, eventually your brain after repeated, 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 repeated listenings you start to like something and need it that wouldn't have been there just on the craft alone. In other words, you know, whether it's label executives or marketing agencies or Christian radio, they can, they can, because they know the psychology of consumer behavior, they can manipulate the system and in turn even an okay song into a hit song because yeah. They have manipulated our responses and that stuff makes me feel icky inside. And I, I find myself and, and maybe it's just because for me, I'm saved for most of it because I live, I live in a small town in the West coast of Canada. I'm nowhere near any of the centers of power and influence, even in Christian music. I'm almost never in Nashville. I'm almost never in any of those places. And I just carry on living my basically quiet life, creating some things, trying to serve people, trying to be faithful. Yep. Occasionally I show up at some of these other events and I experience some of the industry that, you know, you and Kim were talking about. And I feel this kind of like icky feeling and I go, okay, Lord, I just bless these people to, to do the best job they can do. I don't understand some of it. And thank you that I don't have to live in the middle of this. And then I go back to my simple calling, which is, you know, I say, I ride the bicycle with one pedal. I, I, I try and write and create songs from the heart that sing into gaps that nobody else is singing into. And then with the other pedal. I mentor and train other writers and I encourage them to write the songs that are uniquely theirs to write. And I try and stay right out of the, the other fray, but the, the, the fray that, that, that kind of thing, what you're talking about absolutely exists. Yeah. You know, did you feel that pressure when you were younger, like from outside voices to like, Hey, we could make you big time, Brian, big time worship artist. Wasn't as, yeah. It wasn't as big of a deal. There wasn't. You know, when I started in the late eighties, early nineties, it was all in its infancy. You know, you had the, the, I mean, CCM was really pushing strong at that point, but worship music, what was that? Like right. didn't, it, there wasn't. So even the fact that now you have almost at big Christian music festivals that the headliners are like considered just worship artists. Right. is is kind of strange and i think that kind of thing is has resulted in some people then jostling for that position and that and trying to recreate that sound and everything and there comes the it you know there there it comes and it doesn't it doesn't interest me and i i just you know, I just so, so grateful that I've just been able to keep on writing songs from the heart and serving people and a few people here, there, what, like, I don't know. And I, 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 I was invited, you know, I was just at a big UK festival, big church and my gosh, some of what goes on at places like that is really hard for me, hmm. but they're, they're all good people. It's just the whole machinery of it gets, gets going and it feels like okay, I don't think I fit here, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a great testimony, Brian, your life and sort of in, in quiet, in, in secrecy, being faithful to what God's placed within you and kind of leaving the results, so to speak, huh. 
up to the yeah. Lord, you know? And I think that's yeah. beautiful. And that's, that's exactly what I would encourage young writers to do. Focus on the Lord, focus on your community, worship with your community, write for your community, and just let that be local. If for some reason yeah. God takes it global, great. But keep your heart yeah. small, you know, yeah. with, with yeah. your people. Yeah. Brian, I thought this would be fun to do, maybe a little bit of rapid fire here, but I'd love to go back in your discography here a little bit. I'm going to name an album that you were a part of, and I just want you to tell me like what comes to mind, what's top of mind when you hear that record. Does that sound good? Sure. We'll see. <laughs> so, okay. 1994, Light the Fire Again. Vineyard Music. What do you oh, think about my God. that record? Oh, well, a couple of things. One is, you know, even the Light the Fire Again song was such a surprise. I wrote it for this little conference the year before for men and a group of Mennonites. And the fact that that song went on and has had a life. But then there was the. You wrote the Light the Fire Again for Mennonites? Yes. There was wow. a Mennonite renewal conference in Ontario. I was just with some of these people last month. And we were re recollecting how this all came down and, and they they were doing a, a renewal conference and the theme passage was the, the letter and revelations to the church of Laodicea. And I thought to myself, well, we could get together and we could look at this passage and preach sermons on it and try and incur, pray for each other to come back to our first love and everything. But I thought if we're going to actually remember what we're talking about, we should write a song and sing about it. So I wrote this thinking it would be a little, little ditty, a little song that we would sing on the weekend and it would be forgot and, you know, and on it went. But the other funny thing about that album is that Chris Wimber, John Wimber's son, who was the head of Vineyard Music at the time, he said, creation calls, that's not a worship song. We can't put that on, on light the fire again. That's, that's just, you know, a song about nature and stuff. And I'm like, but, but Chris, like. For me, that's the main place. And one of the main ways I worship my creator is I get yeah. out into nature. I hear the birds. I stand under the trees. I stand by the ocean and that's where I experience God. And he, he finally relented. And of course it went on to be one of the songs that I've received the most communications about over the years. It's, wow. I remember when it, Lindell Cooley did that song on one of his projects at Brownsville. Right. I think that was probably the first yeah. time I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I don't, I, I don't even know if this list is accurate, but 1989 Langley Vineyard changed mm -hmm. by your glory, live worship songs of the Langley Vineyard. That's, that's going back the, in time. Tell us about that. Octo October the 1st, 1989, the night that changed the course of my life. I had written you know, these t simple songs, I lift my eyes up for finest fire, faithful one. And the only people in the world that knew these songs was the three, 400 people in our church. And we decided to do an evening of worship and record it and put it out on a cassette, thinking we would sell about 200 copies to our people. And that would be the end of it. And that, that sold about 70,000 copies. Unbelievable. And it just went out and that's, there you go. That's, that's set in motion why we're having this conversation. What's the, what was the recording gear like back then to capture a live recording? It, it was, uh, no, I think it was tape. It was tape based. I'm thinking we recorded onto some half inch multi tracks. You know, we rented in, we just rented in some microphones and a few tape, tape recording machines. And, you know, the church was willing to put up a few thousand dollars in order to do this, in order to serve our own people so that they could sing the songs during the week. They could put the cassette into their car when they're driving to work. And, and so that worship music wasn't just for Sunday that it was for the whole week and we could, we could learn to, to these songs could be on our lips and that's why we did it. And, oh. Love it. All right. Let's, let's jump a little bit more into the future. I guess 2004, which is 20 years ago, but today mm -hmm. integrity Hosanna, what comes to mind yeah. when you think of that project? 
well, it was actually my, my biggest selling out al- like worship album I'd ever done. I had been involved in Hungary, which was sold maybe 400,000. This one sold about 120,000, but it was just a local, again, it was my second project with integrity. And I, I asked them, I said, I'd like to do a hometown evening of worship and involve people from our whole city. So there was like an 80 voice choir made up of worship leaders and people from other churches. We, we, we dramatized the building of Nehemiah's wall. We, we, anyway, we, we like, and my special needs son came up and was involved in this final moment with my dad. So there was, we made a film out of it. Yeah. Just 20 years. Oh, and that was, and at the last moment I wrote the river which was added in and probably has gone on to be maybe the most known song, maybe other than today from that project. You know, what's an underrated song on that project. Maybe it's not underrated in your world, but I see the cross. I mean, I haven't, nobody I know sings it. I haven't probably sung it in like 10 year plus years. That's interesting. For me, it might, I don't know, maybe top 10 of your songs. Like, I'm I'm not even lying, Brian, like I'll put that, that song on like from that project every so often at least you mm. know, f- a few times a year and uh, just the gospel in that song yeah. is just so so moving you know so anyway yeah, it's the me- i think the message of the song is there maybe maybe in some way i didn't i didn't totally nail the musical setting i i don't know you know it's hard to know even why certain songs get really picked up by the church at large and why other ones don't you know right yep what about hymns for life this was just a few years ago oh Oh, such special covid started the world locked down i go to see my dad every thursday morning for breakfast and couldn't even do that for a bit. But when I was able to, I went and sat in my dad's dining room in his little apartment. I, he was at one end, I was at the other, you know, trying to keep our social distance. I said, dad, like, this is a crazy world we're living in right now. I said, I'm a songwriter. I love writing songs, but now's not the time to sing new songs. Now's the time to sing the old songs of our faith. And what if we were to make a project together, father and son, and you help me pick the hymns that wow. mean a lot to you. And so he picked Be Still My Soul. He picked, you know, several of the hymns that we sing together on that album. And now, so such a gift. I just, we, my, my son-in-law filmed my dad against a green screen. And so wherever I go and do live events, whenever possible, my dad and I do a couple of duets from the hymns album, my dad on the screen, oh, wow. me live That's unbelievable. and his tenor soaring above. So yeah, it's, it's a special project. Wow. That's, that's awesome. Brian, let's do one more and then I'm going to put the ball in your court. What's a project or a song that you want to bring up? That's just really really meaningful Mm. to you. Maybe we've Mm. talked about it already or maybe not. Yeah. 30 years ago, Father's House. Mm. My first solo album, I'm just prepping to, to, we're just prepping to re-release a 30th anniversary remastered version of it. And we're recording new versions of Father to Son and There Must Be a Place. And just before this podcast, I was typing out lyrics to send to my art designer and I was typing out the words you know, to, there must be a place and, you know, you, it's so interesting, like, you know, deep down inside, inside my soul, I, I feel passion and fire. I've got a yearning that words cannot express a hunger for love and tenderness. And there must be a place where dreams come true. Anyway, just this, this, this longing inside every human heart for a place of freedom, a place of security, a place to be known and loved. And I'm going, wow, 30 years ago, when I listened to the original, I sound like a kid. Uh, <laughs> so it'll be interesting to, 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 to track a new version of the song, but a lot of good memories and probably the project I've received the most mail about. I almost every week, somebody writes into my website and says, Brian, 
I can't get father's house anywhere. It's not on Spotify. It's not, you know, it's nowhere. How can we get it? And I go, well, it's out of right. print. Finally, this last year, I've been able to start telling me, but don't fret. It's, it's going to be released on all the streaming services and we're going to make new CDs and it's all coming in the fall of 2024. So that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I look at that project and I was 11. So oh, I, I do remember listening to this, but the song that stands out to me is probably more. I do remember that one, yep. but what yep. sticks out to me is the, the guitar work in that song, like the guitar riff for more and the guitar solo. Yep. That yeah, was, that, that was life changing. So, so uh, good. who played yeah, that my, my on good, that record? Yeah, my good friend Brian Thiessen played yeah. that, and and Paul Jantz, who produced it. Paul is the uncle of my current producer, Philip Jantz, and Paul at that time was a pop artist, person of faith, but he was mainly working in mainstream music, and he had a number of pop hits called Amazon Rain and Every Little Tear and all of this. So he came from the that that world and he knew how to push musicians to get what he wanted and he pushed brian t hard like he worked him but that's some of where brian Tyson learned some more of his electric guitar chops you know like just having a producer sit with him day after day and know more of this oh less of this oh like really work with him yep and that that was the result i think that's what i miss most about worship in the 90s was all the great electric guitar work and electric guitar solos you don't you don't find them as much anymore so no there was a there was a backlash against the electric guitar solo I really think. yeah I, I don't know i just felt like it i felt like it everywhere but especially in worship music like that's not appropriate or and i was more like just like of the of the opinion and heart that that as emotional creative beings we're just trying to express our hearts and sometimes there are no words you need guitar solo or the sweeping strings part or this piano thing to say to try and say what words can't say yeah. you know yep. to, to give those emotions flight and and expression yeah well, Brian, I could probably just keep asking you questions all day, but we're going to cut it short here. And uh, not really short, I kept you for an hour. And this was just fantastic. Uh, uh, it's so great to get to to chat with you today. Is there anything you want to let our listeners know about that you have coming up? You just mentioned the yeah. Father's House later this year, yeah. but anything you yeah. want them to check out? Well, I mean, you know, just if they want to stay in touch with me, just go to briandirksen.com and, and sign up for the newsletter. And about once a month, we, we let people know, oh, this is happening, you know, live events or recording. And then the other thing is if there's any songwriters out there that have a stirring to write songs for your church, you know, go to unlockingyoursongs.com. We have a free course. We have a brand new Unlocking Your Worship Songs course, which is shorter in length than the master class. And then we have the full length master class. But we are we are encouraging and mentoring songwriters from around the world, several hundred so far. And uh, yeah, so those are two resources that people can check out. So is that a video course or is it sort of like a semester? Zoom no, it's a, thing. it's a, the, the unlocking your songs are video on demand courses. And I, I, I create worksheets and they do it at their own pace, but then for the master class, then they sign up, then we do some group zooms. Plus it gives them access to one that they can book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me if they want to actually get serious and say, okay, here's two of my songs in process. And I. And I bring my experience to bear on their songs and try and help them make them better. And uh, yeah, it's just something I love. It's, I just love doing it. That's amazing. Well, we'll link all that up in the show notes. So briandirksen.com, unlockingyoursongs.com. Make sure you check that out. Brian, appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time today. And let's, let's do this again soon. Okay. Thanks so much for having me.